Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about the French Revolution. French Revolution is crazy, all right? I put my towel on right this morning. Let me fix it. All right. There we go. Uh, all right, so the French Revolution is absolutely crazy. Uh, this one is just like murdering people and then more murdering and then more murdering. And then uh, what do we do now? Uh, murder some more people. Uh, it, it gets out of hand pretty quick. It starts out kind of like some of the other revolutions, but then it just progressively gets crazier. And so we're going to talk about it today. All right. So the French Revolution. Uh Keep in mind, the American Revolution had already happened. The American Revolution is about 15 years before this. Uh, so the French Revolution sees that, like, America is working. They got their own country. And France still has a, has a monarch. He's not a real liked guy. The issue going on in France is the fact that their leader is Louis XVI. Now, I, I don't know. When I made this, I need to fix this. And it says it in your notes, too. This is Louis XIV. That's uh, supposed to be after the video. It's Louis the 16th. Very different people. Uh, Louis the 14th is generally a good guy. Uh, uh, f well, anyway. Uh, Louis the 16th is the guy we're talking about here. So Louis the 16th had a spending problem. All right. Uh, spent just ridiculous amounts of money. And his wife, Marie Antoinette, uh, also just spent absolutely ridiculous amounts of money on doing all types of, of uh, dumb stuff. All right. Everybody saw them just wasting money left and right. All right. Uh, so they have like a recession in France where they don't have enough money. All right. While the king and queen are still spending just crazy amounts of money. Shocker. They run out of money and they're going to need more money. So to show you how disconnected the king and queen are from society, the famous story goes that Marie Antoinette, when everybody was, was starving outside, they came to her, it's like, Marie Antoinette, oh my gosh, we have to help out the people. Uh, she was like, I'm sure they're fine. They're like, no, they don't, they don't have any bread to eat. And she looks them dead in the eye and says, let them eat cake. Like, because in her mind, if you're out of bread, you just eat cake. Like, those people have probably never seen cake in their life, much less just have, like, oh, I'm sorry, you should just eat the cake then. Uh, and it just shows her disconnect with the people that she is over uh, with that one little story of the let them eat cake. So needless to say, they're massively out of touch with the people. So the way it had, they had like a parliament situation uh, but it was all uh, super sneaky. So in France, while they saw these other revolutions happen, they had created a government, all right? So the people had a say in things. Here's how it works. Uh, their government is divided into three branches, just like Montesquieu, all right? But it's super shady. So each branch is represented, and you get like one vote per branch, all right? The first branch is the king. So uh, Louis the Sixteenth, he gets a vote. The second branch is the super rich nobles, which make up about 3% of society, all right? They get a vote. And then the third branch is the other 97% of society that they vote, all right? Now, the king and the nobles always vote together, so it's always two to one, and they always out, uh, outnumber the uh, vast majority of people in society. So, and their government can only, uh, they're called estates. First estate is uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Second estate is the rich people. And then the third estate is the 97% of society. The only way they can meet is if the king lets them get together. And so the peasants, the, 90, the third estate, they've been wanting to get together to let him know how messed up he is. However, nobody has called it because he's the only one that can convene them together. Well, he ran out of money. So he's going to have to call them together to ask for more money because he has blown it all. All right. This is going to be the start of it. When he asked them to join and convene, tons of people from the third estate show up. Uh, the first and second estate, Louis the 16th and the rich people are like, no, 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 no. Only one of y'all can show up and cast a vote. And they say, nah, we're 97% of the population. We want more control of that. You're not going to overrule us on this because there's a lot of issues that we need to talk about. Uh, 
And they're like, sorry. And they get so mad. The first and second estate get so mad at so mad at the poor people, the third estate, that they lock them out of the meeting room. They won't even let them show up to meet. So they, they'll cast their votes and they'll go on without them. So the third estate's really squirrely. And they go down the street. And it's kind of odd. There is a, they have an indoor tennis court. So this is in like the 1790s. I guess they had indoor tennis courts back then. Uh, they go into a building that has an indoor tennis court and they basically lock the, uh, uh, lock the doors and they say, we are now the government and we're going to call ourselves the National Assembly. And uh, it's called, uh, and their agreements that they are now in charge is called the Tennis Court Oath because they come up with this at the tennis court. Uh, and they say, we are now in charge. So, to show, and they're all like super hyped now, to show how powerful they are. This is 97% of the population. They storm a, it's like a maximum security prison uh, is what it was being used for at the time. Uh, but it's basically anybody who had talked trash about the king gets taken to this place and like tortured and killed. So it's called the Bastille. It's a big like fortified structure. It's like an old castle that they turned into a prison. Everybody, it's a symbol of just like oppression by the people that the king can do whatever he wants and send you to the Bastille. So the third estate, they revolt and bum rush the Bastille, the, uh, the prison, and they capture five guards and they execute them and cut their heads off and then carry them around the street on sticks. Like, this, it's like, it's crazy. And they're like, we're now in charge, right? Uh, and just letting everybody know that this this is now how the thing uh, it now runs, is the third estate now runs the country, all right? So the question here is, why did the third estate decide to start running the country themselves? It was obvious that they weren't being, that things needed to be done differently. And they weren't allowed to have any say-so in society. They just got fed up. And it was time to just... Uh, take over the country themselves because they're 97 percent of the population what's going to happen so if you're a if you're a rich person at the time and you were a noble here's what the smart ones did they immediately showed up to the uh national assembly to, to the third estate and be like hey you know what let me know what i can do for you you're right i'm wrong i've seen the error of my ways what can i do to help you out so a lot of the nobles realize that they're on the losing end of this they're, they're, they're starting to kill people so like hey let me help you out so that they were starting to join the uh, national assembly uh some rich people were more hesitant to do that uh so here's what ends up uh, it, it progressively gets, gets crazier all right so at this point it's still relatively normal so there are we still have a king uh, France still has a king and, and, and Louis the 16th and, and Marie Antoinette. Uh, so even though they've just like decided they don't have any more power. Well, the people, all they've ever known is having a king. Like since the beginning of time, they've had a king. The fact that they've told the king he can't do anything, people start freaking themselves out. Like they just start panicking. They convince themselves that the king is getting ready to send out a whole bunch of people and like kill everybody in their sleep at night that sides with it or whatever. So people start getting really, really anxious that the king is getting ready to kill everybody. There's no evidence of this, it, it, but it's referred to as a great fear. People are terrified and they start marching. People get more and more aggressive trying to like overthrow anything that exists and it's called the great fear and everybody is absolutely terrified the national assembly passes a declaration of the rights of man uh said all men in society are equal it's modeled after the american declaration of independence honestly if it just stops here like boom it's over this is an extremely effective revolution and you and you can move forward from here the people in France do not stop here, and it gets bonkers. All right, so uh, number twenty-two. How was the American Revolution directly? How did it directly affect the French Revolution? Is that once the National Assembly, which was the third estate, then they became the National Assembly and run the entire country. Their constitution, called the Rights of Man, is based directly on the American Constitution that had been created about ten years before this. Actually, about six years before this. Uh, so the American constitution gave the new government in France, all their ideas on how you should, should run stuff. So again, right now, if they're just like, Hey, we're good. We got what we want. Everything is fine. Everything moved on. Here's the problem. Louis the 16th still exists. He's still sitting in his palace. Uh, Marie Antoinette, who everybody hates, uh, uh, is also in, in the palace. 
there's still rich people there who like don't like this new way and they're like what if we like got rid of like there are still people conniving and stuff like that all right uh that still exists because of that the 97 percent of the population freak out and think that these people that used to have power will somehow like something crazy will happen and everybody will die uh so it's a great fear that fear is going to lead to some crazy overreactions all right so it gets more radical pretty quickly. So there is a group of the First Assembly led by a guy named Ross Pierre, all right? The Committee of Public Safety, which is kind of an oxymoron because if, if you see this guy, you're probably getting ready to die. So he goes through and he's like, fine, we're going to deal with all this fear right now. Everybody's terrified of, we're going to stop it. He first thing he does is he drags Louis the Sixteenth out and Marie Antoinette and publicly execute them in front of big crowds with a guillotine. Behead them. The king and queen, whack, whack, dead. All right. Now, you think anybody's still nervous? Yeah, because it's not based in rationality. People are like still scared. And so Ross Pierre's like, gotta kill more people, do I? So Ross Pierre just starts going and finding anybody that had any power before the revolution and started executing them. Then he started executing anybody he didn't think was revolutionary enough. Then anybody who had a problem with how many people he was executing got executed. And then like it just it escalated. In one year, they executed 17,000 people by beheading them. 17,000 people got beheaded purely because they didn't, uh, for whatever reason, you can accuse anybody of anything and then boom, immediately beheaded. So the guillotine was used, big old choppy chop, uh, to behead people at the time. People are just absolutely freaking out on what in the world is, is, is going to happen. Uh, Ross Pierre becomes extremely uh, powerful, but then everybody gets really afraid of what happens if Ross Pierre gets too powerful. So guess what happens to Ross Pierre? That's right. Ross Pierre ends up getting beheaded himself uh, because people are afraid that he's getting too power hungry for beheading people, so they decide to behead him as well. Um, so this is a picture of Marie Antoinette, just extravagance. So the reason everybody really doesn't like her, uh, she, yes, she wasted money. She's an idiot. She doesn't know what's going on. She's also of Austrian descent. Um, so she's Austrian naturally and married into the, the French royal family. Austria is a big enemy of France. So not only did they not like her, she was, uh, naturally from a country that is an enemy of France. Uh, this is like what uh, you behead people and you take them up here, big choppity chop thing. Uh, and you, it's, it's just, it's as absolutely insane as you can imagine. And they, 17,000 people from 1793 to 1794, uh, uh, that, that they beheaded. And these are, these are people who just may not have like been as revolutionary as Robespierre believed that they should be. Uh, so who brought, uh, the reign of terror to an end in France? Oh man, this is, this question is kind of out because this is what we're gonna talk about tomorrow. Uh, so Robespierre does not bring the reign of terror. The Robespierre executing everybody was the reign of terror. It was the great fear when they're like, Oh my gosh, they might, you know, try to overthrow us. And then after that turned into the reign of terror, which uh, is everybody's terrified of getting beheaded because they're not revolutionary enough. So the question here, what brings the reign of terror to an end in France? It's going to be Napoleon. So this is who we're going to talk about tomorrow. So Napoleon is going to bring uh, the reign of terror to an end in France. And honestly, just right here on number 23, if you just write Napoleon and spell it the best you can, that that's all I'm going to need uh, uh, for number 23 here. There's this dude named Napoleon, all right? So Napoleon was working his way up through the National Assembly. Napoleon was a general. Uh, and by the time they had taken out Ross Pierre, there was this like huge panic over who's going to take over, what's going to happen in the future. And then that's when this Napoleon guy's like, hey, I got you, all right? And the story of Napoleon, which comes out of the French Revolution, just just keeps on going and it's a crazy story in itself we're going to talk about napoleon uh, of what happens in the late 1700s right into the early 1800s all right uh so napoleon comes to the ranks in during the uh french revolution uh 
once he saw everybody was just like really, really worn out after the whole reign of terror and everything, uh, he goes in and he overthrows the weak French government. So when I say he overthrows it, he's not going in guns a blazing type thing. He goes in and basically aggressively can convince them that he has a better way of doing it. And uh, like, doesn't really give him a chance to respond. He's just like, we're, we're here now. All right. And it's a three man consulate. Basically it's like, Oh, it's not a dictator. It's me and two other guys. All right. Then as soon as that comes, he's like, and I'm the first council. So like mine counts more than these other two guys. Uh, and also, uh, I'm here for life. This isn't like an election thing. So, uh, very quickly he becomes a dictator here in, uh, in France. Uh, he then, two years later, crowns himself the Emperor of France. He is now the lifelong Emperor of France. So, this whole thing was to not try to have an Emperor. And then, all of a sudden, he has now crowned himself the Emperor. How do you think people are going to respond to that? Here's what's interesting. The people in France love Napoleon. And you're like, what? So... Just because you're a dictator and emperor doesn't mean you're a bad dude to the people. He gives people a whole bunch of rights. He implements all these rights that the average person gets. You can't treat them down. He he treats every, everybody's standard of living pretty much goes up under Napoleon. So he comes in and he wipes out the way of doing things. He's like, nobody's getting murdered. I'm making sure there's no more murder. That was a big reason that people accepted him to begin with is because at least if you have a dictator, you're not just getting beheaded left and right because you don't support whoever's in charge. Uh, on top of that, he actually really focuses on the rights of the people in France individually. So it's a whole different thing. So even though he's an emperor and he can do whatever he wants, he does actually uh, seem to really do a lot of good things for the people in France by comparison to the previous monarchs. So there's a picture on Napoleon. So Napoleon, if, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of Napoleon or whatever, uh, he is like viciously made fun of for being short, right? Uh, like, oh, Napoleon, Napoleon, Napoleon. Napoleon was not a tall man. Uh, Napoleon was, I believe he was five foot six. But at the time, I think the average adult male was about five seven or so. So he's, he's about, he's a slightly below average height. Uh, however, everybody makes fun of Napoleon for being short. And whenever you see caricatures of him, he's always like super tiny. The reason that is, is because he will eventually have a huge, um, rivalry with England. Uh, England mocks him relentlessly in the media and England just claims that he's really short. Uh, while he's not tall, uh, he's not super short, uh, but that they mock him and mock him, make him short. So that's kind of what has stuck in history is this belief that he's like five foot one, uh, and everybody else is six feet tall. Um, that's, that's not the case. He, he might've been like one or two inches, maybe shorter than average. Uh, but he wasn't like super tiny. Uh, so the question here is, is, though France had just fought a revolution to not have a dictator, why did they overwhelmingly allow Napoleon to become one? Well, first off, people got tired of being beheaded. They got tired of, of being killed and living in fear. Um, so that was a big reason uh, he came into power. And then once he was in power, he actually gives a lot of rights to the people, treats them as people that there's rights that you have in society that you can't violate and stuff like this. Uh, he is, by most French people, a really good leader. Like people really like him. Uh, had again, Napoleon just stayed here. He could have had a nice quiet life. People loved him and all that, but that's not Napoleon's personality. All right. This is the man who just overthrew a government that just been overthrown and beheading and all this other stuff. He's, he's a guy that's going to push the limits all the time and he doesn't know how to not push the limits. So, uh, the story of Napoleon is getting ready to take off here. All right. So, while there's entire courses to talk about the Napoleonic era. So Napoleon just starts, he raises this huge army and just starts taking over countries. Just one after another, after another, after another. Uh, and I got a, I got a picture here, all right, to go along. So uh, basically anything that's in any shade of green, all right, is stuff that he took over, all right? Uh, if it's purple, they're friends with them. And if they're orange here, there's only a few of them. Uh, they are his enemy. All right. So pretty much anything that's not orange, he's in charge of. So here's how this happens. So people aren't used to a guy just rolling into your country and taking it over. 
here's why Napoleon did it and, and why his legacy is very like, is Napoleon a good guy or a bad guy? It really depends on a lot of things. Here's why he's not considered the great evil like Adolf Hitler and, and people like that are. A lot of times when these crazy guys take over countries, they like kill all the people they don't like. That's not what Napoleon did. So Napoleon raised an army here in France and he would invade the surrounding areas. Once he would take those areas over, he would take out their government and he would put a new government in. Here's the crazy thing. In those new governments, all the people in that country have more rights. They're treated better. He basically creates like constitutions in their government that say, hey, you can't treat people badly. By doing that, uh, a lot of he basically increases the standard of living for by most of the people that he takes over uh, around him. So he just takes over country after country after country, and it gets fantastic, and people's lives get better. And he actually his army grows from these other areas, places like Austria. <laughs> he's like, uh oh, uh, like how am I going to do this? So Austria and Prussia and, and areas like this. Basically, what they say is like, hey, I tell you what, we'll be best friends with you. We'll implement the stuff you're going to implement. Uh, don't take us over. And so uh, people that knew they couldn't really beat him, uh, a lot of them would t take a lot of his ideas and implement it in their society. So Napoleon uh, through Europe is just kind of wreck and shop, but is, is a relatively popular guy because the countries he takes over are actually... Uh, he's spreading this new idea that people have individual rights and there should be a government and not a dictator in charge, even though he himself uh, is a dictator. Uh, and, he, and is a very, very skilled military uh, commander. Uh, so number 27, though Napoleon had conquered much of Europe, what one country was he most focused on taking over? He really didn't like England here. Uh, so England was the country he is most focused on. England and France have had beef for a long time. England really doesn't like them. They've already have their constitution. They got their parliament, their monarchy situation. So they don't need to be taken over. Their people already have rights. So they're in a position to be judgmental over what Napoleon is, is implementing places. So Napoleon, out of spite, really wants to take over England. It's really hard to do because it's a navy. You need a navy. And England's navy is better than France's navy. So he really wants to take over Great Britain and tries a, a, a few different ways to take over so just to clarify great britain is all of this england is just this one country but they're interchangeable for this class uh napoleon wants to take it over uh but he just never really has the ability to uh so the country wants to take over is england there's been a long history of beef between england and france and they just haven't liked each other for a really really long time uh, but he's never actually able to do that because he doesn't have a Navy strong enough to sell over there and do it. All right. So here's, uh, what ends up happening to, uh, to Napoleon. All right. Again, you can take an entire college course. I did in college on the Napoleonic era, uh, of what happens here with Napoleon. So I got to kind of keep it super simple here. So Napoleon had taken over most everything. And then he decides, let me go back to this map, he's going to take over Russia, all right? So France marches all the way over here to Russia and then invades Russia, all right? What Russia does, and you can see right here the invasion of Russia in 1812, uh, what Russia does, and we'll talk about this again when we get to World War I, Russia has this slash and burn policy. So if you can't stand up and fight against Napoleon's army, which they couldn't, they would just run away through, through Russia. Well, Napoleon's like, I'll chase you. So Napoleon is chasing them through Russia. And it looks like he's just taking it over, taking it over. Well, then all of a sudden, you know what happens in Russia? Winter. And it's like 70,000 feet of snowfall and it's negative a billion degrees. And what happens is when winter hits, and Russia wins like every war doing the same thing. They run away. And then when, when the snow hits, because the only way, like once uh, Napoleon is out here, he's trying to get to Moscow. Once he's out here and, and winter hits, uh, his supply line is way back here in France and his supply line can't get through the snow in the winter here in Russia. And most of his troops, uh, freeze to death. Uh, so of the 400 and he had a half a million troops that invaded in 1800, uh, or 1812 into Russia of those half a million troops, only 10,000 returned. Once he shows back up in France. All right. So to lick his wounds, cause he's really worn down. England and, and Russia, who they're still recovering, England views this is their time to pounce when he's really weak. So they uh, go in and they're able to uh, capture Napoleon. 
they kick him out of power, make him renounce power, and then so <laughs> the, the story is crazy. It, it's it's one of the, the the craziest real stories in world history. So they confine him to an island near Italy called Elba. Now he is so popular. You can't just take Napoleon out and execute him, all right? Because if you take him out and execute him, there's a lot of people that really like him that are going to freak out about it. So uh, his punishment is he's confined to this tropical island in the Mediterranean uh, with, like, all these servants and, and everything out there. And he basically gets to live a life of luxury for the rest of his life. But that's not what Napoleon wants to do. So he, he's confined to Elba, all right, uh, in 1815, I believe, uh, after he is defeated. And he escapes. Elba, like somebody helps him escape and he comes back to France, creates another army to try to take France back over and England has to show up and beat him again a second time. Uh, and the time they beat him this time is a place called the Battle of Waterloo, uh, which is, is, is pretty famous. Uh, and so he is defeated at Waterloo and they're like, fine, we ain't playing with you this time. Once again, they can't just execute him because people will really freak out. So they basically put him on a on an island in the middle of nowhere. Again, he's got like a whole group of people with him that like take care of him. Like he's he's royalty. I mean, he's he's an emperor, and so uh, but and and where he will eventually die about seven or eight years later, he gets a stomach ulcer and, and dies. This is Saint Helena. It's in the middle of no because so France is is up here, all right. Uh, uh, France is right here. Uh, so they have him down here next to Africa. Like this is in the 1800s. You're in the, literally in the middle of nowhere. Like you ain't getting back. You ain't escaping this one. Cause Elba it, uh, is like right up here ne near Italy. Uh, that's where he escaped from the first time. So the second place they put him here on St. Helena. Uh, and he ends up dying about six years later uh, of a stomach ulcer. But so Napoleon, all right, he does help out France because after, uh, after him, they create a normal government, but Napoleon came out at the end of that reign of terror and it really showed people that if you don't treat your own people right, all right, and this is the big fear that, that's going to come out after this and people uh, fix their governments pretty quickly. If you're a government that doesn't treat your people right, you are now ripe to get taken over by somebody like Napoleon who will aggressively take over your country, and then people will love him if he treats you better than your own government was treating you. So uh, after Napoleon, a lot of countries who had been real aggressive on their own citizens realize that times are changing, and it is it is time now to start treating your uh, citizens as individuals and giving them more power in the government. And you, you're going to see a lot more of that uh, uh, after Napoleon. So number 16, what was the issue with Napoleon's personality that led to his eventual downfall? He always wanted more. He was never going to be happy. He just constantly needed to take stuff over. At any point, had he just stopped before he invaded Russia, he could have had that thing on lockdown forever, and the whole country of Europe could have just, or the whole uh, continent of Europe could have just been like France, basically. Uh, but he's never satisfied. He kept pushing the envelope to the point where uh, it would break him. Uh, and then, even like when he was put on Elba, he couldn't just he couldn't just stay there. So his whole personality was always pushing the limits of what was acceptable of what he could or couldn't do.